What does a professional comic book inker do? Well, luckily, we tricked one to join us on the podcast, and we're going to pick his brain for secrets because your geek history lesson is now in session. Hello and welcome to Geek History Lesson. I am Jason Inkblot Inman. I am Ashley Victoria Robinson. Welcome to your Mind University because you have stumbled onto the podcast where we take one character, construct, or creative from popular culture and teach you everything you need to know about them in about an hour. And I am so excited today because we don't have to do the heavy lifting on this one. <laughs> we tricked someone more talented than us to join us. That's right. This is, um. so a couple... Was it a month ago? A couple months ago, we did an episode yeah, about ago, yeah. comic book shops and sort of the secrets of running a comic book shop. And when I was talking to today's guest, it kind of sparked in me that we could do the same thing except about comic book inking, which like I think comic book lettering is sort of an unknown. It's it, it's a, it's such an important part of comic books and art that people don't think enough about. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are literally the heavy lifters. I mean... I've seen pages of Jim Lee's art look great because of the inker, and I've also seen pages of Jim Lee's art look terrible because of the inker, you know? So the inker, again, is such, uh, like, they're the final polish that can, like, really determine how great that art looks. And I'm so happy that we have a talented inker here. No, I'm not saying that inkers are talented. This is going down the wrong way. <laughs> we have a really good one. <laughs> uh, our guest today is a professional comic book inker with 28 years of experience. He's worked on titles like The Flash, Deadpool, Amazing Spider-Man, Legion of Superheroes, Grant Morrison's JLA with Howard Porter, and he currently has a book called Slow City Blues, which is available now for pre-order on Zoop. He is John Levisay. John, welcome to the podcast. Hey, how's it going? Thanks for um, having me on. Uh, I just want to really quickly apologize if I offended all comic book inkers across America right in the Everyone beginning. Everyone who's ever inked Jim Lee is like, <laughs> oh, is he talking about me? Jimmy <laughs> Mickey's going to call you any minute now. <laughs> it, 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 Jim, Jim is a hard guy to ink. It is very, um, you know, it, it, it is hard. He's got his look and it's, it's hard to get past that signature look. So, you know, when you're doing it, I, I did samples over him when I was trying to break in. So I, I have them somewhere. I know I think I still have my original awesome batch of samples that I had, you know, I got to show everyone to get work. So that's an interesting, that's an interesting thing to think about. I'd never thought about that. Yeah. That if an artist has such a, or a penciler has such a distinct style that that would make you, it would be hard to capture his style. And also, I also imagine there's some nerves as well. If you're inking like somebody like Jim Lee or somebody like a Neil Adams or somebody like that, you're yeah. a little worried about like, oh man, I'm going to screw up their artwork. Yeah, there there would be like, I think when I had my first set of like, I was very fortunate because back in the day, you had to get Xeroxes of the pencil and you either uh, light box them when you did your samples, light box them on the bristle board. Or I did it where you take a sheet of vellum, which is a very, very thick mm -hmm. piece of tracing paper. And you do it over that. So I I just randomly got good stuff back then because there was no internet. There was no getting scans and just, you know, downloading and printing out stuff. So I had like a, I had two pages from that X-Men 268 issue. I had a bunch of Travis Charest pages, you know, because he was just becoming, you know, he was just becoming the big thing. So everybody was so enamored with him. I had three, I think I had two or three pieces of his in my submissions. And every single editor remembered me because they were just taken with those Travis pages that everybody, that was my big thing. Every remembered who I was. Wow. That's cool. All yeah. right. Now, before we get too deep into this, John, <laughs> you have a book right now that is available for pre-order on, is am I saying it? Is it Zoop? Yes. Okay. Z-O-O-P. Uh, tell us a little bit about Slow City Blues and how people can check that book out. Uh, Slow City Blues is my first co creative own comic um finally jumped into doing that which you know everyone else is doing their own creator own book as as you guys know welcome to the club buddy <laughs> yes so um yeah i finally decided to do it and you know i i uh, got hooked up with the writer who this is his he just jumped in it's his very first comic book writing uh job he created the whole world and characters and bringing everyone on board and we Ended up deciding to go the crowdfunding route a handful of months ago, and I had never run a campaign before. And I've asked 
you, Jason, a number of questions, a lot, a lot of questions about it. I know how much work it is. And how I know. And I just is. confused you even further. And you're like, I don't even know if I want to do this now. No, yeah. Thanks, Jason. I was like, oh, uh, you know, I, I already have so much else to do, you know, with <laughs> with working and doing, you know, inking pages. And then, you know, we have a four year old daughter. So we're doing that all day. So it's a lot of it's it's a lot of work. And everyone else I had spoke to had told me, like, I'm never going to do this again. It's too much work doing all the fulfillment and everything. So I found out about Zoop. It's a brand new crowdfunding platform for comics. And the good thing for professionals like myself, they're taking care of all the stuff that you're, that is going to take up all your time. The, you know, the fulfillment, the talking to the printer, the shipping, all that stuff that they already know how to do because the guys who own and run Zoop, they ran and managed the Keanu Reeves Berserker campaign and the Scott Snyder Nocturna campaign. So they know what they're doing on that whole side of, the process of crowdfunding. So for pros, it gives you the time to finish. If you're not done with your book, you can finish the pages. You can really concentrate on that and you're not leaving the customers hanging, you know, waiting like, oh, well, it, I just don't have this stuff in yet. So it's a year later, two years later, three years late. So you can really, what our, our writer Sam had a really good quote for them. It was, um, uh, Zoop takes the owl out of crowdfunding. That's interesting. <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> yes. It, no, I, I was like, yep, that's perfect because they they really can handle everything. So um, and I didn't know how to manage anything. I've never called or talked to a printer. You know, I've never tried to you know, like set up a page, which I'm assuming it can't be that hard. You know, there's tons of people doing it, but I, I don't know. You know, I just wanted to make sure it was done right. And I didn't have any missteps or, oh, I should have done this before. I should have done that. So um and, you know, we've got some cool art. And as you know, Jason, you've seen uh, quite a lot of it from me texting you pages all the time. Yes. Yeah, so you got to tell you got to like tell some of the listeners, because I know there is a couple artists that have done some variant covers for you guys that are going to excite that specifically our audience is going to be really excited about because we proclaim. Well, their their, their bona fides. All yeah. The time. So uh, on top of making sure the interiors were really nice and great, and I spent a ton of time on the 160 or 161 pages of the first storyline i wanted to make sure that you know that you got every you know i know what it's like to go to the comic shop every week and you put your money down you're buying these books i wanted to make sure you're really getting your money's worth so you know this is a new book nobody knows really knows what it is you know we're getting you know this, this is the pet my sean mall is a penciler he's been around comics for a while but he kind of took a break we got him back in so I wanted to make sure the covers that I got the best of the best guys. And so there wouldn't be one of these that you know, we all know how comic fans are. They're, they're the pickiest people in the world when it comes to art styles and what guys they like and don't like or who they love and who they really don't like. So I ended up getting a crazy lineup of David Finch, Paul Pope, Howard Porter, Derek Chu, uh, Francisco Matina, Juan Tedesco, Doug Monkey. Carrie Nord, Yasmin Putri, Brett Booth, Philip Tan, Car um, Randy Green, and Brett Booth. Oh, did I say that one twice? Well, I mean, he's worth saying twice, so it's okay. yeah. Okay, well, okay. I, there was there was a lot of guys. So needless to say, I there's you know there's only an A cover and a B cover for each of the five issues. So, um, and I inked five of those dozen covers. The rest were all uh, either the people inked themselves or. They were, you know, digitally painted. So I wanted to make sure we got the biggest guys that were, you know, to come out of the gate. And I, I can say, you know, I, I don't like bragging about stuff, but I can say I defy anybody who has got a creator own book that is going to have a better lineup than this. It is not possible. I, I would agree with that. I it's not possible. And they're all done. That's the other thing. They're all done. The, all, the whole story is ready to go. You don't have to wait. All five issues are, you can get all five issues at once. We're having a season one drop. So you don't have to wait when the campaign's done. We get everything tallied up. We go to the printer. You'll get your books in a couple months. And where's the best link for our listeners to go check out Slow City Blues? Um, it is, you know, I, I should have written this down. It's a, it is um, zoop.gg. And um, if you go, I don't know if I can click out of this, because like I said, if I if I click away from your screen, I don't know if you're going to go away. Yeah, please don't <laughs> click away. <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, if, um, if, listeners, if you type uh, zoop, Z-O-P dot G-G, um, into Google, it will be the first 
search result, and the very top search result under that is Zoop Slow City Blues. Yeah, or if you are on Twitter, if you go to my my page, it, it's in it's in my bio. The link's right there. It's very easy to find. Nice. All right, so. so let's get into some secrets of comic book inking because it sounds like you've been doing a lot of inking on Slow City Blues. Um, just in case, because I believe in the Stanley rule that like you never know if this is somebody's first time ever listening to the podcast. Yes. So just in case they don't know. Explain what a podcast is. <laughs> yes. What is yes. a podcast and uh, what is a computer? No. <laughs> uh, no. What exactly does, how would you describe what a comic book inker does to someone who has no clue? Well, so so back in in the day back in the day when we didn't have the technology we have now you would need you know for the printer or um when they would get the the pages ready to go to print for a comic they they would you know do a i don't even know what the word is jason they would do um like a plate they would do a printer's plate of that page but to make sure it would everything was visible and very clean because technology was not great back then you had that, you know, scanning pencils was not very clear. And back in the day, everybody, you know, everything was late. It's just like today, everything was still rush, 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 rush. So the pencils are just banging out these pages. And back then, page rates were not great. So you would get guys doing two, three, four pages every day. Or you could hear that old legendary story like Jack at Kirby could do seven, eight, or ten pages a day if he had to. And you need that, you, the anchor needs to come in. And make sure everything is clear and clean and separated and, you know, there's depth and clarity and textures that you can tell that, hey, you know, that's a basketball or, you know, this is, you know, rubble or, you know, dirt or textures on a suit or skin or someone's hair. So it's all about separating to make, to, to give that, that depth and look and make everything nice and clear and crisp, you know, and back and now, it's a little different now i mean there's a lot of books that are printed just from pencils because we do have the better technology and, and we have scanners that can scan every molecule so there is that and sometimes they're mostly doing it to save money because they just you know in comics nobody wants to pay for anything but it, there's nothing better <laughs> you're, you're nice. not wrong my friend <laughs> yeah they, they, they just don't you know because that's a thing and you, and you, or, and by that you mean the companies and stuff yeah, exactly. So, you know, why would we pay, you know, if we can just get this for this, it doesn't matter. We'll just slap some color on it and it's fine. But I've seen books before and I'm sure you too have as well where, you know, you can't tell what that is just because there's some color on there. You can't tell. Or um, another thing that pencils would do if like a, a shape is supposed to be solid black to save time, they would just mark it with an X and that means fill in the black. And then when they started just scanning those pencils and coloring them, they would just leave the X in. So we have all these X's everywhere on these pages. I remember seeing that in a handful of like Salvador Loralco issues or Lorac issues back in the day in like Extreme X-Men where they just didn't take those X's out. So it was very, uh, it, I, don't, I just looked at those issues. It was so just disturbing. I was like, I can't even finish this. So, but we've made leaps and bounds, but Anchor's definitely, you know, we, we, get, we get a lot, it's nice we get a lot of credit on social media, but you know, in general, we're, we're there just to help out. You know, we got to make sure everything is nice and crisp. And I, I'm sure both of you agree. I, I, there's nothing nicer to me than seeing on pages, just that super duper crisp and perfect cross hatching or the triple hatching where it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's so nicely done. And you know, Scott Williams will do it. You've spoken like and, a true inker. I mean, I can hear it. Like I can hear, I can hear the ink coming through your blood. <laughs> I agree though. Like I find videos of people inking like very calming and very cool to watch. I just had somebody <laughs> ask me the other day to do one. And I, I don't know. I just have, I, I'm so, I, I'm very good about doing everything, but I'm so lazy about a few things. And I just, can't see myself trying to set up a, ca a video thing and taping me and oh please I do it john please I don't know. you're you're you, know, you would have a hop in patreon or a hop in I, twitch channel if you did yeah, yeah. i know but there's already a lot of guys doing that i mean like sandra's doing a ton of good videos and i see a handful of these other people like you know there's there's already a lot out there there's, and i'm always, so always be more. there's always room for more at yep. the table i'm so particular about how i and with the book with my slow city book i was so there's so many textures there's so there's only one human and all the rest of the characters are not humans they're either you know 
animal like or plant like or whatever. So I painstakingly taken that, you know, took a long time. Like, all right, I want to render out this person, this person. So they all have their different look and feel. And I was just, you know, I, I had my certain way and everybody, every anchor is, is different the way they lay down lines. So everybody's style is, it, it's either kind of, you know, you can say you have a, a wild storm style or you, you know, I was in top cow for five years. So I, I generally have a top cow look as like I've been told many times, which is great because everybody seems to dig it, but there is different things that we would do. You know, like I love the wild storm stuff. Like when, you know, obviously Scott Williams, and when Richard Bennett was there for a handful of years, he was amazing, like, you know, the, the stuff he was doing. So I had definitely looked at that stuff quite a bit and just trying to get everything so rendered out and rendered out. And it just, you know, even with the covers I inked, I had never inked Philip Tan before. And I don't know if it was the best idea to just jump right into it on my own book. Maybe I should have done a test piece first, but I was like, you know what? I guess I know what I'm doing. I'll just do it. And, you know, it took a while. And I, I think you've seen that one, Jason. I, I think I sent it to you. I think, I think so. I think so. Yeah, well, if, I thought it came out pretty, pretty nice. But, if not on um, your own book, where else are you going to jump in? But Well, you know, it could have just shown up. I could have gotten a Marvel piece. Like, oh, hey, we need this. But then there's the ridiculous time deadline of, oh, we need this now. Or I got a Spider-Gwen cover a handful of years ago, and it was so late they basically gave me three and a half hours to do it. Oh boy. And <laughs> oh boy. What? Yeah. On, on top of that, I, I didn't have a printer yet. So I had to, with those three and a half hours, I had to fly to Kinko's, get it printed out. They screwed it up and print Cause you're supposed to print it in blue line. They print mm -hmm. it in green. I was like, I don't, that's fine. I, I gotta go. And I just ran home. <laughs> inked it. I think I inked the whole thing in two hours and like 40, five 50 minutes and i was like okay because sometimes they're just there is no time and if you say no they'll just find the next person in line to do it so i was Let, like you know what it, i have a, i do have a question for you uh because <laughs> I, I do we do want to get to a question where we want to ask you what what sent you down the road of inking but i want to ask um just for listeners how many pages can you ink in a day like what is your average i'd rather okay so or or, or can we not say that because it's classified and if Marvel no, finds no, it's, out, it's they fine. are going to be no, they're no, going to no, give no, you no. more work. <laughs> no, um, I can. I, I would rather just do one. OK, because, you know, you can concentrate on stuff and, you know, you still have to be able to live each day. So, you know, you still need to get up, walk around if you have things to do, whether you have, um, you know, a pet to take care of or you have, you know, a few kids or you have things, you know, you still have to be able to do things in life during the day. Yeah. So, you know, for me, I'd rather not miss working out or, you know, whatever. So I'd rather do one page a day. That's fine. That's doable. Two, two is okay. I can do two. That just means you just don't get up from the table that much. You know, if I have to, I'll eat, you know, I'll just, I'll inhale a couple of meals really quick, or I'll just bring something to munch on sitting down. And you, you just don't, you know, you don't want, I, I usually I'll watch a TV show at night with my wife and, you know, we just wouldn't do that. So or I also wouldn't sleep that much. I'd be going to bed at either 3.30 or 5 in the morning. But um, the most I had to do, and this wasn't the penciler's fault or my fault. There was an issue of Uncanny X-Men I was doing over Lenny's Francis U. A long, long, long time ago. I think it was like issue like 367 or something. And back then he would FedEx the board to me. And of course, customs can decide to... Mm -hmm. let hold out of the package or not hold on the package and they decide to hold on to it for a week so it ate up all my time and by the time that box showed up marvel wasn't interested in their time delay they just needed it done on marvel time so i had to do those five pages in one day wow okay so with people not <laughs> understanding workflow and you yeah. talking a little bit about like the difference between getting your flowers online versus maybe in the larger community or in a credits page. I'm sure a lot of our listeners are wondering what Jason alluded to earlier, why inking instead of penciling, lettering, Pencil. writing, wiping? Um, oh, I, 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 I have a very easy answer for that. I started, I didn't start drawing to us really, really late. I wasn't like pretty much most of the other comic art community where they probably started drawing their four or five. I didn't start till I basically finished 10th grade. So I was really, really, really late. And all of a sudden I decided, all right, 
because I was going to open up my own comic shop. I had thought of that in ninth grade, but I don't know. I just decided not to after like a year or two. And I just started, you know, I was going to start drawing. I was like, oh, this is something people do. I, you know, I have thousands of comics, so this must be a real job. So I just tried to start doing it and doing it. And I just, I was so late. I, you know, I was just trying to figure out stuff. And my art class in high school, I, I took my senior year was, I don't know. It wasn't useless, but I, I could have been doing something else. So yeah, I went to the Kubert school for a year and a half and I just kept teaching myself and I got work pretty quickly. So I got my first professional gig in the summer of 1993, but I was making such strides and advances with my inking when I actually really in 92, when I, I was like, all right, I'm getting better at this each week. I'm going to just push forward with this seriously. But my penciling, I was so slow. I was so slow and I just was so... I just didn't have the years and years and years of education that I, I should have when I was younger. I should have been going to art classes at like the community college when I was in fourth grade and taking this and taking lessons. And just, I was so slow and my proportions, it was taking me forever to work out proportions and this and that. Um, shockingly, my portfolio did get me accepted in the Kubert school, which I was darn sure I was not getting in. I, I was like, there's no way I'm getting in. It was so bad. And I, I just I was like, all right, I'm going to do this. And I was just getting better. And then I was getting work and work and work. But, you know, it just, I was just one of those guys. My penciling was not up to snuff to even try to get work. I would have had just completely stop inking and just focus on that for years and years and years. But, you know, it just, I don't know. I was getting too much work and I was getting too much work on big huge books to turn that down so so basically it's like you yeah that's you, a great problem to have yeah though. you were, that was great you like <laughs> you're you, too good at inking yeah you listen uh, to the universe well, I, I, right. I, I didn't mean it that way i wasn't trying to inflate myself oh no but no, I, no 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 yeah. no no i was gonna say i think that's great because we always say to a lot of our friends and a lot of creatives where it's it's the idea of like listen to what the universe is telling you like if mm -hmm. people keep hiring yeah. you for a certain gig you yep. must be good at it and, and even though it might not be your dream gig you're like oh i'm gonna be the famous steven spielberg but if if people and, keep hiring you to edit films, then edit films because you must be good. And yeah, and you, that's that's the thing is, it, it everybody wants to work in comics, and you know once once you break through that fourth field of actually getting in and getting your first real job, it, it's hard. You know, it's really hard to. I mean, I don't know if it's easier now, but back in the day, you know, it was way it was just harder. You know, no, it, it's still it hard. hard. So you just <laughs> when you when you get in, you got to just do it. You can't like, oh, I'm going to change this or this. But, you know, once you get in, you, you're, you're just in. And even I had someone told me I didn't start working for D.C. until the fall of 2003. And I kind of never tried to get in before because everybody told me it was so hard to break in if you unless you were some like superstar. But once you broke through that force field, you were in. And if you were reliable and you weren't a problem, you could just keep getting work. And it, it, it kind of, well, they were kind of true. Has it been I, true? Yeah, it kind of was true. Yeah, once, like, you know, Howard Porter got me in because he said I had to ink the flash when he was going to start with Jeff. And that got me in. It broke me through the force field, and I literally had worked for them full time for, oh, God, I think it, that was 2003, and I worked for them pretty much, like, 90, 95% full time until, like, 2000. And, 13 mm -hmm. i think yeah well i want to i want to ask you and this is kind of a two-part question here mm -hmm. i want to ask you like what excites you and inspires you about contemporary inking right now and how how the how the business sort of works like you you mentioned howard porter you've done a lot of work with howard porter we're big howard porter fans mm -hmm. on the show it, it, for a modern inker in 2021 um or even pre the pandemic is it better if you're sort of you know, is it better if you are the the Paul to somebody's John Lennon or the John Lennon to somebody's Paul? Like, is that easier for an inker or does that not matter? Like, is it better to find like an artist that knows that you can handle their style and you'll always make them look good or, or like? Or, oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing there's nothing better in a comic. And you guys could you've probably seen this a lot of times. There's, there's nothing, you know, more copacetic than seeing a pencil or an inker that super gel. And like, it's just, it's just great. Every page is perfect. Whether, whether it's just somebody walking down the street or somebody just punching nonstop, you know, and, and you get the trifecta if the writer, if the writer and pencil and anchor just click and that 
Yeah. So it doesn't happen a lot. It happens once in a while. But I mean, those are the stories that you will just keep rereading, re- rereading. Yeah, but. you can tell it's it's it becomes. I, it's funny because those books always pop to the top because like you yep. when you remember it, it always becomes instead of two names instead of just the writer and the penciler, yep. it always becomes three names. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know, and you know the yep. three names. Like you know, th- I mean, that's how I figured out who Danny Mickey was. You know, yep. I mean, and and uh, Norm Ratmund and, uh, you know, like he's like, Jordy oh, Belair on the colorist side. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Like, yeah. Yep. Like there was there are those certain names that keep or even uh, 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 Scott Williams. Yeah. For Jim mm-hmm. Lee as well was like I, I, yep. I would always see his name next to Jim Lee or Terry also and John Byrne. Yes. Yeah. You know, it, you know, it's funny because the X-Men had that trifecta thing many times. They had Claremont, Byrne and Austin. They had Claremont, Romita Jr. and Dan Green. And then they had Claremont, Mark Slavestri, and Dan Green. And then they had Claremont, Jim Lee, and Scott Williams. Mm-hmm. It just and those are the ones everybody loves. You, I mean, you'd be, you'd be hard pressed to find anyone that doesn't like those those issues. All right. So now another question I want to ask you is the second part of this. We're in the digital age. Mm-hmm. Are you a digital inker or are you a traditional? I don't know how. I'm pretty. I was like, I'm, I was pretty certain you were a traditional inker. I I do not know how to digitally ink. Um, the it's only okay, thing we don't know I can, how to ink anything, so you've got both of us outstripped. <laughs> yes, so I do not know how to do digital inking. Um, I just I'm an old school guy. I like having I like having the boards, and I know people tell me I either hear it is quicker to do it digitally or it's not. So my thinking was I, I'd rather have I, I can do everything just as quick as I need to, or slower, or really fast on the board. I already know how to do it. I know the techniques. I know how to move certain things. I know which nibs. I just for everyone listening, I do everything very old school. So I use a, a dip quill that you that you dip in an ink bottle, and it's a little metal nib, and you do all your stuff. I don't use brush, which I only use brush to fill in the big black areas. A lot of guys do use brush for doing their line work and rendering i've, I've seen I've, some inker share pictures where they use sharpies um, i've seen it oh no. i have seen it well um <laughs> wow usually yeah. a lot of the guys now which has become very popular are those um uh those th- they look like markers but they're like these little ink um pens and but they're it's it's like a marker tip Mm-hmm. Um, Mark Morales, everyone's using them now. And Mark Morales tried to, tried turning me on to them like a handful of years ago. Oh, and I, I, oh man, I don't know the name of that, but I have one of those. Are those like Copic markers? Some no, the no, Copic are the gray tones. Um, but I know wait, it, I, I know have it, I have one right here. Hold it's, on, yeah, it's a black pen and it sort of has a brush tip, sort of. Yes, I got one. I got one right here. This is a yes. I, you are right. It was a Copic multi liner water Copic proof pigment ink. Well, let's say we're both right. There you go. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, but it looks, the tip looks like it, it, it is the tip of a marker. It's just very, very, very tiny. Um, yeah, Mark, everyone's using them. And most of the pencilers who ink themselves now are using these because they they don't want to have to worry about, when, you, when you're an inker, the biggest thing is control. So you're using a nib. And you have liquid on it, you know, it could splatter, it could go go awry, it could catch the fiber of a paper and not work out. And brush is even harder. You know, br- it's very, very, very difficult to be really good with a brush. It's very rare. And there, there's there's a handful of guys out there who are, but using these uh, little Copic multi-liners, it, it's, it's a little, okay, easier isn't the right word. It's just there isn't room for splatter or, you know, there's going to be like bleeds with the ink running down the page or something. So they can use these and there's a handful of guys, they look great. And I'm sure the examples would be like J. Scott Campbell, Olivier Coppell. Um, I, forgive me if I'm leaving out the other. Those are just the two that pop in my head immediately from seeing pieces that they posted. But this these are really, really, really popular. I did use them for a little bit. I was more concerned about, so when you, when you do finish a page and you have pencil, when you're done with the inking, you erase all the lead. So the page looks very clean and it's not going to look all messy and gray when you scan it. So my concern was when you erase it, the lines sometimes lift off, even if you're using ink. So when you're using a marker, they could, it could come off even more. And, you know, I didn't want to have to sit there and keep re- going over lines well, and me, i'll do that even with ink and i'm super duper duper meticulous to make sure my pages look as crisp and clean as possible so that once in a while a line will lift off i'll go over but the marker 
I, I was a little too fearful that like not just three lines would show up, you know, go away, maybe like 30 or a hundred lines might go away. Then yeah, I got to redo the whole thing. Let me ask you a question because back in the day, it used to be that it was always this one piece of art, this, this one page, this one mm -hmm. board, the penciler would draw it. Then it would get shipped to the inker. The inker would, yep. would ink it. Usually this was all done in New York. And then the letterer would letter on top of that page. Yep. Like that's why yep. some of the coolest things about the old pieces of art. And we're going to get yep. to that conversation as well, that you can, you have word balloons on it. Whereas modern art, you don't really have word balloons on it. A it's all done digital. Now for 2021, for you, are you working all on scans? Are you, are you touching original art? Are you actually inking on top of original yeah. art at any time? Still? It's a little, it's a little touch and go. So I'm one of the Chris Picello anchors and, um, yeah, because you worked on uh, Doctor Strange a little bit, right? Yeah, I did that. Mm -hmm. I did like 15 issues of Doctor Strange. And then I just, I was part of his group. So we just went right into some Spidey stuff and then Peter Parker and then Deadpool for a little bit. And then we're on nonstop Spider-Man right now. So in the beginning of the deadline, I'll get a few lead pages from Chris. But generally when it's getting to the, the last couple days or the last usually two three days of the like the deadline then he'll send me a scan and then i'll print it out but so generally when i get paged them it's like the first couple are actually lead and then the last couple are the blues so oh interesting okay yeah and you know chris's chris's style was so new unique you know no one else it seems that he doesn't have a clone in the industry which is very nice but um it, it's funny because he'll send me a page it's, it's you know oh my god i don't know if we're gonna get this done we're gonna get this done and he's like, do you think you'd get it done? I was like, look, if you just get it to me, I'll figure it out. And I, I was like, have I ever let you down? He was like, no. <laughs> I was like, All right, then just, I go, please send it over. It's fine. And, you know, it, it, it's cool. He's, his stuff is great to do. It's a lot of fun. So, um, yeah. <laughs> I'm still getting lead pages once in a while. Yes. Okay. Uh, you've mentioned like a ton of awesome projects, even more than what we talked about in your intro already. But what are some favorites that stick out from you from everything that you've worked on? Um, definitely like, you know, the Howard Porter stuff, accents, uh, you know, Howard's Howard's one of my better friends, even out of the comic industry. I've been friends with him forever. He's like the nicest guy. And we talk every week on the phone that we have for ever. So it's it's nice to get. You know, to work with guys are, are very cool, and his stuff is great, even though he's probably one of the more humble and he shy guys in the industry. so you know, humble. He, I, I got to meet him very brief one of my first years at DC when I was doing the yeah. show there, and I, like, just was heaping praise on him, and I made him sign yeah. some of my JLA issues, and he was, like, surprised that I was, like, he was the person I was the most excited to meet was Howard Porter. Yeah. And he is the most quiet Yes. <laughs> and he, he hates praise. I, I, I give it to him all the time. When I write it, he's like, Ugh. but, and it, it stuff's great. You know, I've done probably maybe almost 800 or a smidge over 800 pages over him after all the, the issues we've done. And he, you know, and he was gracious enough to do a cover for my slow city book, which it looks amazing. So that was very cool. But that one's all digital. He almost asked me, he's like, Hey, we should do the inking thing again. I was like, whatever you want to do, it's fine. But I knew he was just going to do a digital because he's so, you know, he has so much stuff to do. So I didn't even think it was going to show Does Howard Porter but, draw completely digital now? Yes, he has mm -hmm. since uh, 2012 or 13. It's all digital. He hasn't had a real board it, it, since then. So. Wow. Oh, yeah. I um, definitely tried to buy <laughs> some Scooby Apocalypse pages for him. And there's none. And he very kindly said, well, I'll send you the tip. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. Um <laughs> And there, one JLA thing you guys would dig, and probably not almost no one knows about this. So, I when John Dell left JLA to go over to Crossgen, that was issue forty, like that last big storyline that they were doing, whatever that big World War Three or whatever it was. And the next storyline, Howard wanted me to come on board. That was the thing that he he said like John's going to come and ink me, and I had not broken through that DC force field yet, and they just said no. You know, we have our guy. We're using our guy. So, and I was super bummed because I love that storyline they did where um, uh, Ra's al Ghul and... Tower of Babel. Yeah, that one. It was, it was great. <laughs> I and, that um, one oh, it's, <laughs> it's yeah. the only JLA story where Ra's al Ghul messes with the JLA. <laughs> yes, and I was so bummed that I they just wouldn't let me do it because I really liked that story even, even after, since Grant left, it was a Mark White story. It was great. Yeah. 
And um, I love that cover where Roz is walking through the, the graveyard with the costumes on the crosses and stuff. And I so tried to buy that from Howard, but it was already gone. Um, so we're also, um, we're big Mayday Parker fans. Yes, that was another, that's another yeah. one of my big ones too. So a follow-up question I want to ask you. That was like this. the coolest thing I discovered when I was looking yeah. through your credits list. Yeah, we're big <laughs> yes. fans. Of that, that, I, I think is like, that is one of like the unknown hidden gems that a lot of people don't know about in Marvel uh, is that Spider-Girl run. But yes. I want to ask you this, as an inker, what was it like working on that run? And then also the follow up: um, Is inking Spider Man's or any version of Spider Man's costume just a pain in the ass? Mm-mm. No, I love it. I could do it all day. I've heard too many guys complain. Oh, I can't draw these webs. I was like, that's the thing. You know, if you, you know, I, no one's a bigger comic guy than me. You know, whether it's my collecting or my love of it or the 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 drawing part of it. You know, there's a thing or two I don't like doing, whether it's this person's costume or this but doing the webs on spidey that's nothing it's like the best part it's uh, the best part I, I have to i'm sorry you cannot introduce that without us following up on it yeah. what <laughs> what costumes do you really um, enjoy and what costumes are you just like also if you don't want to say what you don't no no if you're worried the dc force field might come no, down no, 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 no um i'm trying to think i think it's they're just little tidbitty things like if there's if their costumes have too many like I like Iron Man, but I don't know how enjoyable it would be to do an issue or multiple issues of him because it's all circle templates and ellipses and you know correct you know because there's nothing I hate so many more. Bolts. Yeah, exactly. So there's nothing I hate more unless it's a certain style let that doesn't need to be perfect. So if I see a tire and it looks like somebody just loosely threw that in, I can't stand that stuff. Unless it is a certain style, say it's like Bills and Cabbage or whatever. But, you know, Iron Man has all these perfect bolts and these ellipses and circles and he's always around machinery. And I just got, I was like, Ugh. and you got to hope your epitograph doesn't clog and it's a whole, it's, that's the stuff that I don't like. Or if there's little, you had brought up the Legion before and I, I did a, a, an amazing year on the Legion with Jim Shooter and Francis Manipool, trying to make sure I remembered those silly rings in every panel was not easy. Oh yeah, I forgot yes. because yeah, you have and, to remember that every character is wearing a Legion ring. And they all have the Legion belt buckle and it has to be perfect and it has, can't look wobbly or it can't look, you know, <laughs> out of perspective and da da da. And, you know, I was like, uh, or Starboy has to have stars on his costume. And like the cover I just posted today on Twitter, I was like, oh, I remember having to frisk it that off, which frisk it is a plastic film he cut around to make sure when he's doing he so throw the splatter, it doesn't get everywhere. So um, I just remember Starboy was showing up all the time, those issues, which the costume's super cool. It just was taking too long with all of the insane amount of line work I was doing on those issues to cut that frisket out all the time. And then he had a belt buckle and he had his ring and he had this and he had that. So. What is, um, okay, so you bring this up about the, the frisket. Yeah. Um, what is, what is like a weird inker's trick um, because I'm certain you have like all kinds of weird tips I do. and things I you do to get textures. Yeah. So yeah. like, what is like one of the strangest things you do or that people might not even realize when they're looking at the comic book, but you're like, oh, I, I, I get a rubber balloon and I poke some balloon, uh, some yep, holes in it and I throw yep. ink at it. And <laughs> <laughs> You know, anything, anything can work. It doesn't matter if you're using a brush, a quill, a Q-tip, or if you've shaved down a stick, you know, anything will work as long as you're getting the desired reaction and look that you want. It doesn't matter what you want. It's, or, you know, people do that. Um, I'm sure you've seen this has been very popular the last handful of years. I think Sean Gordon Murphy really, you know, pulled it out of, you know, it, it's everywhere. Now, the little fingerprints you see like in smoke, like for smoke, they use fingerprints. So that texture will be everywhere. I have tried that. It, it irritates me to no end that I cannot make that work. I don't know why. I've tried it and I had a, there was another technique a buddy of mine showed where for throwing stars, like you said, for splatter, or if they've done that for blood, you just put some stuff on the edge of a toothbrush and you just kind of flick the bristles and you get all that stuff. But he has it where he can put it on his quill and take a razor blade and flick the quill. A I razor tried. blade? 
You guys just have rogue laser <laughs> razor blades lying yes, around? Exa- yeah, have everything oh else. God. It's a rough life being a comic book geek. You got to fight the penciler yes, for jobs sometimes. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So it would; those two little things are irritating me to no end that I couldn't make them work. But, you know, I'm sure there's stuff there's stuff I do with my wrist or, you know, making lines move that other guys can't do or this or that or, you know, they want. So everyone has their look and everything's right everything's wrong it's just all comics you know so if you dig it you dig it that's how it works okay so before we pivot into the collecting side and we yeah. all start screaming did you uh, want to talk about spider girl oh we, Ooh, you want we to bring can do some... more spider girl Let's well talk I, about can, spider here, girl. I can I, you were asking me like some of the better things so there was you know w- w- going back to the quick thing about howard it was great work with him because he's been one of my better friends forever but also pat olaf drawing spider girl i've been super great friends with pat forever forever since like 97 and um he's another very nice guy incredibly talented with his he has that very old school classic storytelling which we made a perfect match because he had that perfect classic marvel 60s storytelling his drawing's great but i could bring it into now with all my updated textures and rendering so we had that great look and I did a ton of stuff over him. And I, my first thing I did for him professionally, I did that pinup that was, I think, the last page in the first Spider-Girl annual where she's kind of hanging upside down next to that big building. And then um, the who was writing it? What was it? DeFalco? It was DeFalco, yes. Yeah. So <laughs> he, he called me up. <laughs> and I'd already been working for a bunch of years. He called me up. He's like, I can't believe how good this is. He's like, I, 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 I got to get you some work. Have you worked before? I was like, yeah, I, I, I've done some pages before. It's okay. I'll, it's, it's very nice you say that. It is very funny. He's like, I've never heard of you before. You're obviously a nice yeah. <laughs> and, and I don't know how anyone could forget me because no one has my last name. So I have that very unique thing where everyone True. will remember my last name since no one has it. But And then I got to do, um, I did issue 33 with Pat, a spider girl, where she fights that other Spider-Man. And... Um, I did 39 over Chris Batista. And then the best part was I got to do issue 42 and 47 over one of my favorite guys when I was a kid, Rod Friends. And it was like the best thing to get to work over. I've only been able to work over a couple guys who I just absolutely loved when I was a kid. Ron was one of them. So nice. it, it was very, very, very cool. Um, all right. Well, that's really good. I mean, any, any other, I mean, how, Tom DeFalco, besides not knowing who you were, was he fun yeah. to work with? <laughs> I guess that was the only time I interacted with him. I met him once at a con after that, and he had a good chuckle about it. But that was, he was like, oh, yeah, you're super good. Don't just forget what I said. And that was it. All right, so, so but no, he was, he was very nice. Let's let's put this out here because uh, I would never ask you favorite because I think that's unfair. Mm. And, you know, it's like asking you to pick your favorite child. Um, take Howard Porter out of the running. But yep. who is an artist out there past or current that you, every time you, you ink one of their pages, you just really enjoy it. Um, geez. Um, I got to ink a lot of Jimmy Chung stuff. Jimmy's amazing. He's super duper duper. Great. Yeah, um, he's also super friendly. We know Jim. <laughs> yeah. Jim's great. Yeah. Jimmy's great. Um, I was very fortunate when I was at top cow. I, got to ink a lot of Mark Silvestri stuff, which I was too new and that probably should not have happened. But with the luck of insane deadlines, I just got thrown a ton of pages and I, uh, and Mark was very kind. Um, I, pro- I was nowhere near ready, but he, Mark is like the nicest guy. So he was very good about like, you know, he talked me through a couple things and I could, have, I could go up and ask him questions. He was never he was never too busy for me like to knock on his office or if I had a question or whatever. So, um, most of the top cow guys are great. I got to do a lot of Michael Turner stuff. I got to do all the guides except for, um, Billy Tan. So I got to work on a ton of Brandon Peterson stuff. Joe Benitez was amazing. David Finch. I got to do a ton of stuff. So a lot of those guys, I know there's some other people and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to forget. 
who they are, but um, that's okay. All the guys. <laughs> yeah, I, I've I've been very, very, very fortunate. I've probably worked over a hundred different pencils. See, listeners, this is how you know John is a professional because I gave him a hard question, and he was just like, you know, all the guys. So that's no, how, I, that's it, how it, he it, keeps working. Is. Yeah, truly. <laughs> no, there there is because like I can do certain things on certain guys that won't work over the other guys. So if I can have this, I can do this one texture. It's fine because some some dudes. They don't want you to do anything. You do what I got down. That's it. Thank you. Good night. And if you do add an extra line, they will not be shy about telling you that you you screwed up. And they, you know, there was one book. I'm not going to tell you what it was. Um, I was roommates with Joe Weems for 12 years. And Joe is one of the best anchors in the industry. And he's worked over everyone who's amazing. So he had done this issue. It was awesome. And I am incredibly picky with stuff. I was like, God, this is so good. The penciler came back over like a week later and made Xeroxes and circled these very minute little things that he said was wrong. And I couldn't believe he had the gall to do that. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, no one, no one can be satisfied. So, Okay, so with that in mind, yes. um, what do you wish people knew or appreciated more about comic book inking? Obviously, you've already startled both of us with some of your techniques and tools, but yeah. is there anything else that you think our listeners should know or should appreciate that maybe goes unthought of? Um, I, I know like everyone likes to bring up the tracing aspect and, you know, it, it, it it's a joke and it's a funny joke and it was funny in 98 or 97 when that movie Thanks, came Kevin out. Thanks, Kevin Smith. Yeah. And, no, it was funny. You know, <laughs> it, was it was a funny, funny joke. Yeah. It was funny in the movie. It was funny when the actor said it because they know how to speak. But, you know, there is more. And, you you know, I've had gigs where it is just you're just tracing it. I mean, I, you know, I've had guys or you get the pencil. They will say, just do what I have. Do not do anything. And you kind of have to go along with that. So, you know, I've had some gigs that are so easy because you just literally don't have to put that extra ink or thought into it. You're like, all right, he's got what he's got. Let's go. Boom, 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 boom. But, you know, just, you know, inking still a skill. And um, everybody on social media is, is generally very nice with the praise they've given um, inkers in general, whether, you know, they're, they're talking about this guy or this girl and stuff. So just, you know, it, 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 it's, a, it's a job and we all love it. And, you know, we wouldn't put up with the razzing, I guess if we just weren't, you know, totally in, like we were totally invested in doing it. So in making sure the, and that's the thing, I want to make sure every page is great and, you know, the fans dig it. And, you know, I, I don't want to be embarrassed to show anybody anything. So you want to make sure you're putting, you know, everything you can into it. All right. So to end the, this, when we were first gathering this episode and talking to John about doing this episode, John revealed to us, everybody, that he is a big collector of comic book art. And he also sent me his page from comicartfans.com <laughs> of all the pieces of art just to make me jealous. And so, John, I want to talk about, we're going to talk about some of your pieces, but um, what got you into collecting original comic book art? Was it just, let me let me ask you this. Did any um, pencilers ever give you or gift you any of the pages that you worked on? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, uh, and ran randomly enough, that Howard page you probably dig and with Superman on the TV screen, he gave me that one. Yeah, everybody. So, uh, yeah, you know, again, we we cannot speak the praises of Howard Porter enough, and, and we got to get Howard on the show eventually. But ah, good the luck. The, <laughs> yeah, good luck. Uh, we tried. Uh, the first <laughs> we'll get him one of these we'll, days. We'll she says threatening. <laughs> we'll, we'll trap him in a corner. Somewhere. You know what you, you, know you got to do is that you have to get he and I at a show. Oh, Done. And then, oh, all right. Have you seen that old, old DC interview we did when we did the Flash? They videotaped us at the, I think it was the Wizard Philly show. If no. you find it online, it's very fun. They did a whole slew of those interviews at the time, and everyone said ours was the most um, relaxed and enjoyable because I think I was laughing through the whole thing. <laughs> it. Um, I, if I find it, I will send it to you if you I, haven't seen it. I was going to say, or I will find it and share it on the socials for everyone because that's yes. got to be too good to miss. Yes. No, was, and that was back when um, I was... Put, I put out a ton of weight. I was like super big. So I would say how big I was. <laughs> well, the page uh, don't 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 do that, listeners. The page yes. we're talking about is in he. John here has a page from JLA number one, uh, favorite series of the podcast, page nine, and it's this this page of like all the TV monitors, which of course mm -hmm. is not a thing, but it's of course it, it's the best because it has long haired Superman in it. Yep. So yeah, I saw that you have Jason's you, favorite Superman. Oh man, you have a page from you have. 
just to have any pages from that run is pretty amazing. But like you also have another person that makes me kind of jealous is you have a page of Mike Waringo original yes, art. And from you Sensation know, that was a gift. That, that was a gift. Uh, the ink, the great anchor Rob stole. He just randomly gave that to me to show it. just out of the blue. It was very nice. Of him. I've, I've been friends with Rob for, a, I haven't seen him in a while, but I had been friends with him since I started working and he just randomly gave me that nice Mary Jane page. Yeah, you have some great pages, but I want to ask you, okay, so what what got you into collecting original comic book art? Okay, so I was a big collector of everything when I was a kid. I got the collecting bug. My my dad was a collector of coins and military patches as a kid, so I was very much into collecting. I didn't know there was a thing, original art, until I was getting the Comic Spires Guide, which, you know, of course, I'm, you know, back in the day, there was a weekly newspaper they would get, and there was all the comic news, and there was you know, ads for selling comics and everything else. In the back, it was always classifieds. And I saw some people were selling artwork. And I was like, I, I just, I didn't know what it was. So I was like, I ran, I was like, well, there's a page. And I love Justice League when it came out, Kevin, the Kevin McGuire book, one of my favorite books when I was a kid. It was so different and it was actually funny. And I loved his style. He came out of nowhere. And there was a page from issue 23. And they said, so I didn't even know what it was. I sent them and it was super cheap. I sent them my 85 bucks and I just got this thing in the mail. And then I actually did dawned on me. I knew that originals were drawn at this size and this is what it looked like. And I got to see art because though I was just starting to get in the drawing. Like I said, I was late. So I bought that page right around sometime in 11th grade, maybe the end of 11th grade. I don't remember. So it was like a long time ago. And then, so that just started the whole thing so back then pages were not expensive whatsoever and i was just buying pages and buying pages but the difference was you couldn't just go online and go to ebay yeah yeah anything (laughs) yeah so i get home from school whether i was driving my car to school or i was on the bus and we had a one street street so it would drop us off the beginning and we were waiting i'd be running down the street every friday to go to the mailbox to get that issue of comics bar guide turn the back right away zing thing and you had to call them right away and hope it would the page is still there because it was a one of a kind and i did find this out many 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 years later that a lot of the serious collectors back then were getting the those comics bars guides fedex to them the day before so they were soaking up all the good pages so there was not a chance i could get a lot of good stuff back then there is always in comics collecting or action figures there's always a group of people who yep, they figured somehow it out how game the system <laughs> and you know and i was a kid and you know i just could get what i could get and i had been working since seventh grade so i had just I, I was working all the time, so I had a ton of money just to garbage up and make my collection huge. I had a ton of comics by then. And then I got on the art, you know, so I started doing that. So I just lucked out and I randomly was getting really good pages, you know, just where now I don't think that would happen or they'd be so expensive now. It just wouldn't be possible. So what are some of your favorite pieces that you own and are they newer to your collection or are they from those halcyon days when you were first collecting? Yeah, I got a bulk. <laughs> uh, everything everything that you guys have seen that page, I'd say probably 70% of it I bought back in the earlier mid-90s. And it was just, I really, really went on a freeding frenzy because everything was so, I, I mean, maybe the prices were fine at that time period, but they just weren't, they didn't seem as bad as they are now. So I was just going... I was Michael Golden's one of my favorite guys, and I was just garbaging up on his pages. I was just buying them, buying them, buying them, and I have a ton. Um, I don't know that I have the most out of any collector. There's probably a couple guys that have like some complete stories or something like that. But I have twelve Batman. Wait, no. Yeah, I have eleven Batman family pages, and I have one of his um, black and white pages from one of those Marvel magazines, and. Um, I have a lot of cool stuff. You know, there's certain guys. I used to have this great page from Vigilante Number 1 by Keith Pollard, and I had it forever. And some guy begged me and begged me to sell it to him. So I think I bought that page for 20 bucks back in the day, and then I sold it for an insanely healthy profit um, a handful of years ago. Well, another so. thing that you have, which I think a lot of listeners, it's, this is an unsung hero of comic books, is that you have some original art from Don Rosa. Yes, yes, yeah, I you love have, Don. You have a couple yes. Donald Ducks, and the cool thing is, and I would love, uh, Ashley, if we could share this on our social medias, is that yes. it looks like, and call, correct me if I'm wrong, 
Mm. You have, it looks like you have an original commission from Don Rosa. Where yes, it's Donald I Duck have a picture. good story for that too. Okay, please tell us the story. Because okay, Don so, Rosa, everybody out there, if you don't know, is very famous working on Duck Comics and uh, Uncle Scrooge. and, yep. and he's Genius, a, genius, genius at level. One artist. of the greatest artists ever of all time. Yes. And it bums me out that I do not have a page from him, but they're very rare. He still has most of them because he's been just saving them for his retirement. They're very rare to find out in the wild and they're very expensive. And it, it bothers me to no end because I'm never going to be able to afford. I love Carl Barks, who is the other duck mm-hmm. genius artist. I'm never going to be able to fo- afford a Carl Barks page. And almost none of those exist because back in the 50s and 40s when they did comics, the printers just threw away the originals. Never, nobody kept anything. Mm-hmm. So um, I, believe I got... A, isn't there a story that Marv Wolfman once talked about that he went into the DC Comics uh, office and he saw a bunch of that art on a on a trash can and he just like scooped it all up yep. as a little kid? I, yeah. <laughs> or I heard another story from the early 60s where there was a leak in the ceiling in the Marvel office and they just shoved old Spidey pages up there to soak up the water. Oh boy. Uh, yeah. Okay, so back to Don Rose. Yes. Wow, well, that's <laughs> horrifying on like a level so, I can't um, articulate. <laughs> I, Don used to do a lot of shows back then because that's when he was doing like his Donald Duck and Uncle Scrooge books are coming out very regularly here in the States and I love this stuff I instantly took to his style because it was going to be very hard for some of the top Carl Barks and this guy filled the shoes so I got a couple of the commissions and we did a signing together at the main mile high store I think in 2005 so it was me Jim Shooter Don Rosa and about like 10 other guys I'm blanking on their names, but it was all well-known people. And I knew I was just finishing up my run on the flash. I knew Don was there and I had, I had to get him. So I brought everything. So there was going to be no excuses. So he was there and you know, everyone's in the superheroes and you know, I knew he probably wasn't going to get mobbed. So I made sure went over there, lavished him a ton of praise and attention and I was like, hey, you know, I'd love to get a piece from you. I, I had, the, I, you know, I, I, he had done like three other ones. I was like, you had this and this. I'd love to get a new one, blah, 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 blah. He's like, oh, yeah, sure, sure. And so I had this idea since I was on The Flash and somehow I thought this was funny is having a shot of Donald wearing the Flash ring and the costume is spilled out of it. And then like, he's like, well, how do I get that back in here now? And um, he was not interested in doing that one bit. So <laughs> it was a weird conversation. And I was like, well, why not? He's like, I don't know. I just don't want to. And I was like, <laughs> but, you know, and there was nobody in, you know, this is going to sound not nice, but there was no one else waiting. And I was like, well, come on. And then he's like, well, I didn't bring any board. I was like, I did. And I bring up some board. <laughs> he's like, well, I, I don't have any colored markers. I was like, I'll find some. And I ran over to some guy, got a whole set of markers. And I was like, here you go. And the look on his face, he's like, Oh, you kid. Oh, he was just so <laughs> not wanting to do it. And he begrudgingly did it. And then he's telling me this whole story how he was there when Carmine Infantino created the costume. And he's like, oh, you know, he's just not pleased drawing this. He finishes it. It looked great. It looks I was, awesome. I was, yeah. I was so happy. And he, was, he wasn't as upset when he finished it. And I was like, oh, my God, thank you. I will not because we were going to be there for like three days. I go, I promise I will not bother you one more second the whole trip. I I appreciate you doing this. It means a lot to me. And he's like, all right. right." So I saw him. I saw him like five years ago, I think, at a show. And I had a picture of it on my phone. I was like, hey, do you remember doing this for me? He's like, oh, my gosh, I do. And he's like, you know what? I do like this now. Uh, he's like, can you please send me, can you, you mail my scan of it? So I did. So at least he got over it. And okay. it, and at least great. he wasn't That's like. That's so sweet. That's yeah. like a yeah. perfect story. <laughs> yep. No. And again, he was not interested in doing it one bit. The look at his face was not good at all. Well, and well, I, John, like, I'm going to give you the credit that I think you might have ensured that Don Rosa continued to do conventions after that sketch. Like, I, he I might don't have been know. done. <laughs> Maybe, but, you know, I, I was so, you know, he gave me every excuse and I, I had an instant solution. Uh, final question for you in terms of hmm. collecting original comic book art pages. Yes. Um, what is your tips and tricks, best advice for somebody who wants to start collecting original comic book art pages? Uh, probably the best thing, just get what you like. You know, don't get something you you, you yes, assume yes, yes, is going to yes, just yes, go yes. up in value. Mm-hmm. Don't get like, oh, my God, this is going to be this is the hot character for the moment. I'm going to spend a ton of money on this splash page and I'll be able to flip it in a year or whatever. Just 
just get what you like, you know, or, you know, it, the, depending budget wise, you know, maybe work, start, start off with getting commissions. They'll be a little cheaper than getting like a real page or a cover, which, you know, now prices are so crazy. I, I mean, it, it's very, I haven't bought a page. Well, that's not true. I actually traded, I, I got an, a Michael, I got a Michael Golden page um, for me, my ridiculous obsession with it. Um, I traded off two pages. So I didn't, I traded that and I got some cash for it. So I didn't technically put any money into it, but you know, just, just get what you like, man. If you like Wolverine, you know, look for, look for a Wolverine page, you know, just, and it's, there's so many different options. You can go on eBay yeah. and every artist has a rep. And if you go on comic art fans on the side of the, on the left side, there's all the dealers that are repping people. And um, there's every, everyone on social media selling their pages. So you can go on their Twitter or Instagram or Facebook and they'll have stuff. Yeah, and, I think the um, last original art page I bought was uh, it was a page of Black Magic by Nicholas Scott. And because, yeah, if, if you follow the artist you love, everybody yeah. on Twitter, like she was just doing a sale. And I was like, boom. Yep. Or, you know, if you are looking, if you don't have a lot of money, you know, just like buying a comic at a convention, wait till Sunday because no one wants to carry that stuff home. Yes. Yes. You know, if, if you, if, but it also is harder because of that one, that one of a kind page is only one of a kind. So a lot of times everyone will just scoop in that first hour of the show and just pick up everything. But you know, a lot of people, they'll, they'll, they'll probably have their stack of super expensive stuff, medium price stuff and much lower price stuff. So there's generally something for everybody, but just, you know, take your time. There's always more pages every Wednesday. So, nice. you know, if they, you know, just, don't don't pull the trigger on something that you're not 100% sure of. And then like you're a week later, you, you regret, oh, I shouldn't have spent all that money. But, you know, just make sure it's something you really like. Well, everybody, uh, don't forget to go check out uh, John's book, Slow City Blues. You can find it at zoop, that's Z-O-O-P dot G-G slash C slash Slow City Blues. Um, if you were to say a couple sentences to somebody who was like, oh, I don't know about Slow City Blues, like how would you how would you pitch them on that book to be like, you definitely want to get this? It is it, it's just a crazy amount of this the story's great. There's a crazy amount of just action and the ending the ending's very heartfelt from you know, even like when our penciler came on board, he had, the, the big thing he sold me on bringing him in was you know, he started to tear up when he got to the very end of the story, when the whole thing, you know, climaxed. And he's like, yeah, I started to tear up a little bit. I was like, yep. I go, that's it. You got it. You know, you, you sold. So there, there's a ton of different characters there, you know, uh, the detective is trying to redeem himself from, from a terrible accident. And he's just, he's basically stuck in an infinite loop in his conscience. And that is the whole construct of slow city. So he is, he, he's just inside his head and he can't get out. And he's trying to just still run his regular life as a detective and get this all going. So it's, we've got, you know, you can go to the page. I'm not a writer. I'm probably describing this very poorly, but go to the, go to the Zoop page. There's a nice, very nice description about the story. And um, you can, you can see the great covers we have, all the, pro, all the items, the issues. We have just single issues and hardcovers. They're very modestly priced. That's the one thing I want to make sure. I made sure since I'm a collector, everything is very nicely put together, and the prices are really fair. They are. They are very well priced, and uh, so you we'll have a link to that in the description of this episode. John, also, where can they find you on social media? Um, I mostly do most of the stuff on Twitter, so it is w w the number one. So w at one John Levise. Awesome. Uh, and well, I post every day, I post a, a neat book from my collection and some sort of peace of mind from uh, either a published book. Like I've been, I found, I, I found a stack of all my Legion stuff when I did that. So I've been putting up on my, the ridiculous covers. That I've been <laughs> and, and we'll um, be talking to him about some of his key issues, everybody on the Patreon over at patreon.com slash Jawan. So yes. uh, check that out. Definitely. Uh, everybody out there. Thank you so much for listening. Don't forget, Ashley, they can follow geek history lesson on social media where you can do that at geek history lesson.com, facebook.com slash geek history lesson, or on Twitter at G H L podcast. And don't forget. You can follow Ashley on Instagram and Twitter at Ashley. V Robinson. You can follow myself on Instagram and Twitter at Jawin. That's J-A-W-I-I-N. And now hashtag stick around the last section of our podcast where we make sure you stuck through the plugs. John, 
what is the one piece of original art that you own that you will never part with? Say there is a fire at your house. The kids are outside. The wife is outside. Uh, you can only grab one piece. What's the piece you're grabbing? Oh, uh, I grab. Answer like Howard Porter's listening. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think unfortunately it has to be one of my Frazettas. Because they they don't come up that much. As much as I maybe would say that's, a Michael that's Golden piece, very fair. <laughs> I, I, I'd probably have to. I'd have to say one of my Frank Rosetta pieces. Nice. All right. Well, that's an excellent choice. Well, John, <laughs> thank you so much for joining uh, us on this episode of Geek History Lesson. Yes, and uh, I, I didn't even put this on there. If anyone oh. has any slow city questions, you can go to our Twitter and Instagram, which is Heck at yeah. SCB Comics. At SCB Comics. All right. Well, John, thank yes. you so much for joining us. I had a great time. No, thank you. It was very cool. Thank you very much, you guys. And listeners, thank you so much for joining us uh, for listening to this episode of Geek History Lesson. I am Jason Razorblade Inman. I am Ashley Victoria Robinson. And <laughs> Professor Jason, would you please dismiss the class? Class is dismissed. Watch out for the ink. <laughs>